Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today is Brian Noyes. Hey, Brian. Good to see you again. Brian is an RD, an MVP, a speaker at the VS Live conference, which is here on campus this week. Correct. Fortuitously. Yeah, very uh, good both time. Both for you and the attendees and for me, because you get to be in the show. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you're also CTO at Soliance. Correct. Okay, and a expert in many things, but what we're here to talk about today is PRISM. Right. Which is the MV MVVM framework that Microsoft has done a number of versions of. You could call it an MVVM framework, maybe. That's a contentious <laughs> point, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What would you call we, it? Uh, well, the patterns and practices guys that produce it would call it a set of guidance, which is really ambiguous. Okay. But uh, it's really a toolkit. There's, you know, there's distinctions between a framework and a toolkit versus a library. A framework kind of dictates to you how you build your entire app whereas more of a library or toolkit provides things to you know help you build it and you can choose which parts of that you want to use okay so some people frown on calling prism a framework that's the only reason so I, I use to that. I use terms in the in the non-rigorous <laughs> yeah. sense um, guidance building blocks toolkit framework it all it's, works for me it's code I don't have to write <laughs> Right. That's that's, exactly. that's how I when I say something when I call something a framework, I'm basically saying it's plumbing code that I don't have to write. And that's somebody a good thing. smarter than me who knows this stuff better than I do wrote this and hopefully wrote it in a manner that I can also use. Yeah, I think I, I only react after being beat up before myself by the purists. Uh. Okay. So I use framework in the in the lower F sense. <laughs> so Prism is all of those things. Yes, absolutely. Okay, it's been around for a while. Yep. Um, yeah. Let's review the various incarnations of it. Sure. Um, so this kind of shows a timeline of, you know, back in the annals of time when dinosaurs roamed the earth in 2008 and WPF was fairly new, mm -hmm. had been out for about a year and people were kind of floundering around trying to figure out how to use it uh, appropriately. So patterns and practices kicked in, said we need some guidance around this, and they came out with uh, the really long name, Composite Application Guidance for WPF, mm. which then became Composite Application Guidance for WPF and Silverlight mm -hmm. in the 2.x. So, you know, really long names there. But from the start, we had been codenaming it PRISM, and everyone just referred to it as PRISM. So PRISM 1.0 came out mid-2008, um, addressed a number of patterns, and most of those things are still in PRISM 5 today. Uh, there's some, you know, minor updates that were done to some of the main features uh, in the subsequent releases. Uh, but it's really been those same core features that have stood the test of time and, mm -hmm. and people really use them. So then 2009 to 2010, the 2.x the versions were really taking what was done for WPF in version 1 and porting it over to Silverlight 3 and then Silverlight 4 okay. and just making it work for the, the Silverlight arena as well. And then in 2012, what Prism... What happened to Prism 3? <laughs> that always comes up. It was that era where everyone was trying to align their version numbers with the .NET oh, version number. Oh, right, that, So yes. everything had to be 4.0 if it was I aligned with .NET 4.0. Yeah. So Prism followed suit there Didn't, as well. Um, I think Workflow Foundation yes, did went the from same version thing. 1 to, to version, version 4. 4. There was yes. no 2, there was no 3. <laughs> yes, I do remember same that. Same era, yep. Yep, okay. So... Prism followed suit, and uh, Prism 4 came out. There were a number of new features there. One was they uh, added support for managed extensibility framework as a dependency injection container. They added some navigation features that got further enhancements in Prism 5. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what else? Oh, better MVVM support was, was a big part of that as well. And then 4.1 just kind of updated it when Silverlight 5 came out. So then... The team switched gears and down at the bottom there we show Prism for Windows runtime. So right. this was when Windows 8 was coming out and you know you had a lot of people who were migrating over from either WPF or Silverlight and starting to build Windows Store apps and a lot of them had been using Prism and said, hey, we want to be able to do that same stuff that we did for our other XAML apps. We want right. to do it with, for these new XAML apps. So the team put together Prism for Windows runtime. And one of the things I'm calling out there in the timeline is that with that release, we started to recognize that there's parts of Prism that can apply to both arenas, both the WPF side of things. Silverlight at that point was starting to, you know, get into its phase of most people treating it as somewhat dead or dying or just not, you know, expecting future enhancements. Um, but we at least recognized that the WPF, you know, heritage of Prism was going to live on somewhere beyond that. Uh, and you have this new 
uh, vein of Prism for uh, Windows Runtime or mm -hmm. for, for Windows Store apps. So we started trying to look for opportunities to factor out shared functionality into portable class libraries. So the pub sub events that's called out there in the original Prism, there was a thing called composite presentation events, which was basically a pub sub eventing pattern. Okay. But it was baked into the core libraries and it was coupled to the individual platforms of WPF and Silverlight. So Prism for Windows Runtime there, we went ahead and factored that out, put it in a portable class library, made it so that it didn't depend on anything platform specific with the intention that that could move forward mm -hmm. and, and eventually be shared with the WPF side of things. And so that comes to fruition here with the release of Prism 5 in the April timeframe of 2014 here. And in addition to uh, kind of deprecating, uh, basically what they did is they deprecated a number of things that were in the original core libraries to kind of replace them with newer, you know, better things uh, that are in the Prism 5 release. Okay. And one of those is that pub sub event. So the, the composite presentation events are still in the library so that people don't totally break if they were depending on those. But for new apps being built with Prism, they can just use those pub sub events from the portable class library. Yep. And likewise, uh, a big focus of the Prism 5 release was more MVVM support and, and better MVVM support. But again, we tried to recognize that we're doing MVVM on the Windows Store side, we're doing it on the WPF side, try to get as much sharing as possible there. Okay. So the uh, as much of the MVVM uh, functionality as, as could be was factored out into a portable class library as well. So that means that you could then use that theoretically in uh, a cross-platform app of using the Xamarin tools, for example, or right. or any other. Yeah, and there was some discussion of going down that path. I'm not sure whether that will be pursued or not as you know, as a separate effort, but definitely opens the door for that uh, in terms of being able to uh, do that because there's definitely nothing in there that's specific to any right. of the platforms that would prevent that that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Or you could use them if you're doing a Windows 8 and Windows, Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. Yes, and that's Windows that Phone final block. Light. Yeah, so that's that final block in the bottom right corner there is the team's been working on taking the Prism for Windows runtime release and updating it to work with universal apps, which is okay. the, the project model that lets you have one code base for Windows Store and Windows Phone 8. Right. Right. So that's so the, the universal apps are, are Windows Phone 8.1 using the Windows runtime. Right. If you're using the old Windows Phone 8 runtime, which was the Silverlight runtime, gotcha. then you could still use the MVVM and pub yes. sub events Yes, I believe, the, I okay. believe so, yeah. I that's, believe the targets for those were included. Right. Yep. Okay. And, and then in fact, when we first did the, the pub sub events one with the uh, Prism for Windows runtime, we even made it so it would support Silverlight or um, phone, Windows Phone 7 Silverlight. Right. So. Okay. Yep. Cool. So Prism 5 mm -hmm. um, is... Reduce. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, came out in April. April, and, yeah. And so, what are some of the things that are? Do we want to talk about what's new with it first, or do we want to kind of back up and talk a little bit more about Prism at a little bit higher level? We did have well, uh, those guys on the show a while ago. Um, yeah, that, I think that was about a year ago. Yeah, yeah Blaine and, like and Francis. Yeah. Blaine's the program manager, yeah. and Francis was the lead. Um, so that was right right about when Prindo, Prism for Windows Runtime came out, mm -hmm. and they were highlighting the features of that. Right. Prism for Windows Runtime and, and Prism 5 have a little bit different feature sets because a big part of the uh, the overall goals of Prism, you know, if you step way back, what was the point of Prism in the first place was to help people build uh, loosely coupled, maintainable, extensible applications. Mm -hmm. Well, extensible isn't really that can't mean the same thing in a, in a Windows Store app because right. at the end of the day, you're shipping a signed binary, you know, that you can't dynamically load things right. at runtime the way you could with WPF apps. So some of the uh, early features of Prism of modularity and regions and dynamic composition just don't apply to Windows Store apps. Um, but on the Windows Store side, there were things that um, the team was trying to demonstrate to help people adopt, you know, to move over to that arena. And things that were very specific to the platform, such as the, the lifetime management of your app and mm -hmm. the state management of your app as it yep. goes off screen and gets suspended and terminated and then comes back to life and trying to manage all that state 
overlapping that with the goals of an MVVM app, which is that your state management happens back in a view model. Yep. All the APIs for state management, as far as platforms concerned, are in the, the realm of the, the views themselves. Yes, they are. <laughs> so we had to kind of bridge that gap. And, and by the way, I'm doing my typical schizophrenic thing here, we, they, we, they. Um, so the reason for that, just so people understand, is I work directly with the team as a vendor on Prism 1, 4, and Prism for Windows Runtime. Mm -hmm. But then I was just an advisor for the rest of the releases. Okay. So there's certain things that I have more of a, a they association with, and there's certain things I have more of a we association with. Okay. So if you hear that schizophrenic tone, that's <laughs> what's going on there. Um, but yeah, so the, the extensibility doesn't really apply on the Windows Store side, but then there's platform features of Windows Store that the Prism for Windows Runtime guidance tries to demonstrate. Right. So, you know, there is a distinct feature set to the to the two sides of things. But the, the Prism 5 for WPF, you know, another big thing that's different there is for WPF. So all the previous two through four releases mm -hmm. of Prism were for WPF and Silverlight. Right. So to, you know, be able to leverage all the latest, greatest stuff of .NET 4.5, you know, was the main target for, for Prism 5. Um, and again, now we get into version version disalignment there. Uh, the reason they went with a major version number is because they did some uh, assembly refactoring and uh, and moving things around and deprecating things okay. that were you know they are breaking changes. You can't just take a, uh, a Prism Four application, replace all the you know uh, replace the binaries with the new binaries and expect it to work. All you really have to do is remove some references and add some new ones. Mm -hmm. But it goes from being like three references to five references okay. because of some assembly refactoring. So because it's breaking changes, they decided to go with a major version number and go to five instead of four point something right okay um, so yeah so prism five gets rid of uh, silverlight support it's adds in a bunch of new MVVM functionality um, and it does some minor enhancements to the navigation and then factors out uh, as much of that functionality into portable class libraries as possible okay so when you say new MVVM functionality it's it's not that there are new things in MVVM, no. but it's doing some of the things that are typically associated with MVVM and now doing some of them that it wasn't doing before. Right. So when, so, you know, if you go back to Prism 1, we sort of thought we were doing Prism or MVVM, but yeah. MVVM was, you know, was just newly coined at the time, mainly by the blend team. You know, there was a, a, a one page blog post out there right. saying this is MVVM. So no one really knew what it meant or exactly how to do it. And, and so between the Prism 1 and Prism 4 timeframe, the pattern itself matured a lot. Yes. The community started using it. People found different variations on how to do it well. And so Prism 4, you know, tried to align as best that it could with those practices. But at that point, Prism was not an MVVM framework at all. It had a little bit of support for MVVM. Okay. And so it was more that we took all the samples and quick starts and stuff and tried to clean them up and make them more in line with the way people were doing MVVM. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't look into the Prism libraries and say, here's all this stuff that helps you do MVVM. There wasn't much of that at all. Okay. Whereas in Prism for Windows Runtime, because we were trying to align the MVVM pattern with the platform lifetime navigation features, it was more of an MVVM framework, if you will, for the, the Windows Store apps. So Prism 5, now we kind of branch and merge back into Prism 5, and it's taking everything that came along from Prism 4, but then trying to pull back over some of this MVVM frameworky type stuff from the uh, Windows Runtime side. Mm -hmm. So you get more of a, now Prism 5, I would say, is more of an MVVM framework than it ever was before. Okay, fair enough. So is it easy to get started using? Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I, and people tend to go look at the whole slew of features of Prism and get intimidated because yeah. it does have a lot of stuff in it. Um, so to me, there's sort of a, a lightweight way to start using Prism, and, and especially with the MVVM stuff, that is kind of the lightweight way is to say, okay, I want to just do the minimalist MVVM patterns. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do I go about doing that? I don't care about modularity and navigations and regions and plug-in functionality and all these more extensible, you know, modular right. kind of things that Prism does. I just want to have some, you know, better separation of concerns in my app. Um, so MVVM, you know, can kind of give it that way. So we could look at some code real quick yeah, that sort of that. shows that. 
me go ahead and switch over here to Visual Studio. What I'm going to show here is one of the quick starts that's uh, part of the toolkit. They have a bunch of quick starts and then they have this one big sample app that kind of ties everything together into, into a more real scenario. But this just shows, uh, you know, I talked about a bunch of new MVVM enhancements. It's, it's a lot of little stuff at the end of the day. So what you have is some base class support. Um, when you go into a view model, we'll go to this one first, you'll see this bindable base class. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who jumped on Windows Store applications early on uh, with Visual Studio uh, 2012, you might recognize that name. Whenever you created a Windows 8 uh, application or a Windows Store app project, you would get this common folder generated right. with a bindable base class in there. Now that yeah. kind of went away in, in 8.1, uh, but it, it established a good pattern for basically the I notify property change pattern. So we went ahead and, and pulled that same pattern into, into Prism, in Prism okay. for Windows Runtime and then Prism 5. And so that's just a, uh, you know, we can just go to definition there and see that it just encapsulates that in your objects that are gonna derive from this, you can just call set property from the set property blocks that will trigger the property change notification mm -hmm. if it actually changed. So it does the value comparison, just kind of encapsulates that standard stuff so that you can basically have one line of code in your set blocks. Right. And you'll see that if we go to our uh, questionnaire view model here and look at one of its properties, you just end up calling set property in the set block of your property and it takes care of triggering the, the property change notification. Okay. So it's a small thing, but it's a really important thing when it comes to MVVM and data binding. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing that's kind of all new in Prism 5, uh, but came in from Prism for Windows Runtime is something called a view model locator. So this is sort of a pseudo pattern that layers on, layers on top of MVVM. It's a way of getting your views and view models hooked up together. Um, whenever you're doing MVVM, you always have to take your view model and make it the data context of your view mm -hmm. somehow. And there's lots of different ways to get that done. So you can do it statically in the XAML of the view. You can do it statically in the code behind of the view. A view model locator is a way of just kind of standard, standardizing that. Whoops, let me go to the view itself, making it declarative in the view itself, but not having the view be coupled to exactly what view model it's getting or where it's coming from. So this one little, uh, it's basically an attached property from yeah. a XAML perspective, kicks in the view model locator and says, go find me my view model and set it up as my data context. And what it uses by default is convention. So kind of a convention over configuration approach that says, okay, by convention, I'm expecting that all my views are in a views folder and all my view models are in a view models folder. Mm -hmm. And I know that this attached property is being used on a class called main window. So I would assume that I have a main window view model over in the view models folder. Okay. And so I should new up one of those and set it as my data context and then I'm off and running with my MVVM stuff. And so now, it doesn't care what whether your view models are in a namespace called well, view it's models. Well, it, it's, it's actually default. going more by namespace. So I say folder, but because Visual Studio creates the namespace based on the folder by default, it's really going up one level in the namespace okay. and then so down. So this convention is assuming that when you create view models in the view models folder that you leave the namespace application dot view models. As a starting point, yeah. Okay. So like any convention over configuration approach, you got to pick a convention. Got it. And uh, much like ASP.NET, uh, Web API and MVC, there are, you know, rigid conventions for how you do things if you want everything to be automatic, but then there's right. always overrides. Okay. So, you know, this is one of the first ones that people go, but wait, I want to put my view models in a separate library maybe. Well, that's fine. We've got hook points. There's hook points where you can override the process of identifying the name of the view model based on your view. Okay. Um, there's a hook point to actually take over the construction. So basically supply a factory method um, through a, just through a delegate, a func delegate that mm -hmm. says, no, no, I'll construct my own view model based on the, just tell me what the view type is and I'll figure it out from there. Um, and then you can also wire in a dependency injection container to be an automatic factory for okay. all your view models. So it can go through a resolution process and do dependency injection as part of that. Right. So they're just, you know, a couple of lines of code for each of those to wire it in and say, I'm going to override the convention and do things for myself. Okay. So basically what we have is, you know, at a, at a main window level in this case, let me just show the app here. It's very simple, just a uh, simple one. 
I, I, this actually, for people who have used previous versions of Prism, especially Prism 4, uh, one of the other you know non-trivial efforts of Prism 5, but not new functionality, is that most of the good samples, the quick starts that were part of Prism 4, were done in Silverlight 4. Because at the time, 2010, everything was moving towards Silverlight. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the quick starts, they, the, the team decided just for scope reasons to only do it in Silverlight. Now we're you know kind of pushing that aside and going back to WPF. So all the quick starts got ported back over to WPF. Okay. So functionality wise, it's just a little you know data entry form. Of course, our quest would have to be the Grail, and I'm dating myself there. I'm sure there's many viewers that have no idea what, if I could even spell it, uh, what I'm talking about, and then I'd pick the wrong color and get thrown into the pit of eternal peril or whatever yeah. it was. Um, but uh, basically, you know, it's just a data entry form, and if we hit submit down here, it goes into the output window. Uh, but it's just showing the basic MVVM pattern, getting the hookup between the view and the view model, uh, using some of the other features that have been around since Prism 1.0, such as the command pattern, exposing command properties from your view model that get triggered from the view, but having an implementation that's mm -hmm. MVVM friendly for that. So most MVVM frameworks or toolkits like MVVM Lite and Calibre have something similar here, usually called delegate command or relay command right. or the normal names there. So that stuff's all there, um, but the kind of new stuff is the the view model locator, the bindable base, and uh, that's mostly it. Now another one I wanted to show just real quick. Let's just go to uh, this. Is an extension I did. Um, tried to fit it into the scope, but it just didn't fit into the scope of Prism 5. But one of the things we did in Prism for Windows Runtime, because the, the platform itself, WinRT, doesn't really have any built-in validation functionality. Right. So we put some guidance in there. You know, if you're building a Windows Store app, you're taking in data input, you want to be able to do some validation. So we put some functionality in there around this class called Validatable Bindable Base that's in the Prism for Windows Runtime. Mm -hmm didn't quite make it into prism 5 so i just kind of added it as an extension to show you know people should understand that one of the key ideas of prism is not just that it's this library you take it and use it as it is it's an open source toolkit right. and so you can either you know take the library and do extensions to it through inheritance and stuff like that or you can just take the source code and modify it and and make it do what you want it to do okay so i just took this as an example and this was one place where uh, there's this class in the Prism library. It's called Errors Container. Unfortunately, a couple of the members didn't end up protected, so I couldn't just inherit and, and extend. So I had to just pull the open source code over and, and make my modifications as needed. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but then I took basically this uh, validatable bindable base. You can see, first off, it derives from the new bindable base of, uh, of Prism 5. And then it implements the I notify data error info interface, okay. which a lot of people don't realize came into WPF in, in 4.5, really came over from the Silverlight side of things that puts an async pattern onto standard validation. Yep. But it's natively supported by the bindings is the important part. So this basically gives you a base class that you can inherit from either your view models or your, your model objects and tie in validation rules through data annotations primarily and have them automatically evaluated when the properties change and just have it tie in with the bindings and their their uh, native presentation of validation errors. Mm -hmm. So you can see this in play real quick if I run this. Um, it's designed so that it doesn't you know put errors in your face until you've done something wrong. Basically don't annoy the user until they've actually done, broken something. But now you know it's treating an empty string as it or you know take it away as a validation error and you get the standard boxing and stuff there and that's just being done. I'll show the code, but it's a just a data annotation on that property. And so I could fill in a couple fields here. And then when we get to the phone and start filling in, I might do, uh, let's say, 703 for where I live. But then we've got a rule in there that says, OK, for, for this app, for some reason, they really like San Diego. I grew up there. I'm kind of biased. <laughs> That's still my home, even though I've been in the DC area for over 10 years. Um, so it only wants San Diego area codes. So we'll put that in. That gets rid of one of the errors, but it needs a full 10-digit phone number. So we get to here. And I'm going to uh, pause for a moment here to speak. I get close to this 
oh wow well, it already kicked in <laughs> so I, what i wanted to show there that they only use that number in movies so i also wired this ah, up so you can okay. have an async validation go out to the server execute some server rule have it come back and have it just kind of pop in there asynchronously mm -hmm. And that's some other, you know, that's something that's not in the Prism for Windows runtime stuff that I kind of added as an enhancement here. That's cool. Um, but just showing the, you know, the basic experience there. And that all really comes through by simply inheriting from this validatable, bindable base in the model object. And then putting your data annotations for the synchronous client side kind of rules that you have. And then for that async or you can see down here the uh, the phone number is more complicated because we've got that custom validation for the San Diego area code and then a regular expression for the 10 digit, 10 digit uh, US formatted and no I did not come up with that regular expression myself uh, theft is the uh, form of flattery there but uh, the async part if we go into the view model we can see this just one line of code here where I can point to something that produces a collection of errors asynchronously. So just a task-based async method that I can point to and say it's associated with the phone property on that object. And what I have down there is, just get it on screen here. Whoops. <laughs> so this is just a simulated proxy here but the idea is going out over a service boundary, executing some server business rule that mm -hmm. produces errors, get those returned, and you can see the async await task-based async here, but ultimately it just produces a collection of errors. Right. And that gets added into the collection of errors produced synchronously client-side by the data annotations. Mm -hmm. So this just is an example of something you can, you know, take the Prism toolkit and then build on top of it and add your own functionality into it. So you said that's an extension that you wrote? Yes. So this okay. is available. I did a, uh, a blog post on this on the Pluralsight blog. Okay. So you can just go search uh, Prism 5 validation, maybe add Pluralsight into the, the search term, and you'll land right there. Okay. So that code's easily available for folks. Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. All right. So that's kind of big picture on, on Prism 5 there. Um, you know, a number of new features there. I mentioned there's a there's a minor update to navigation before with the uh, navigation functionality. One of the features of Prism since the start is something called a region where you can plug views in that mm -hmm. don't know anything about the hosting app themselves in a loosely coupled way. And navigation lets you change those through a navigation scheme. So one of the new features in Prism 5 is being able to pass object references for parameters before you had to put a query string there for parameters. Okay. But uh, just a minor new feature there as well. Okay, um, so do you want to give us a sense about, um, and this question is, is a valid one, anytime there's um, guidance, frameworks, toolkits, whatever, right. there's a learning curve. Definitely. Um, and so there's obviously benefits to having fully adopted these things. You, right. You write better code, right. more maintainable better code. That's the theory. The theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Generally, it's the practice, I would say. Yeah. I mean, for certainly for, for something that's been around a while and is used by a number of people and written by smart folks, we'll, we'll give them that. Right. <laughs> um, but there's a learning curve, and then there's always the fear that you wind up spending as much time learning about the toolkit and about the way somebody else did something. Um, versus writing, actually just writing the application. So, right. so give us a sense, um, should you, you're doing XAML, should you always use this? Should you always use Good one? Question. Should you ever do these things yourself? It's not so much how does this one compare to the other ones, but it's more of a, of a general question is what would your advice and recommendation being for someone who says, well, I'm gonna write a XAML app, um, should I go and get a toolkit? So yeah, I would say definitely use a toolkit. You know, one use a separation pattern. MVVM being the primary one for mm -hmm. XAML. Um, so use MVVM. Yes, you know, an app of any degree of you know significant amount of code there. It's worth having that separation there just for maintainability, if not for testability. Um, if you're going to use the pattern. Don't try to invent it from scratch and, and you know, f establish your own way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Pick one of the toolkits, whether it's Prism, MVVM, Lighter, Caliburn, or the three primary ones. 
you know, pick one of those and let it guide you down the right path of doing MVVM right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's the, the light touch, like I said, use of Prism, that you can pick Prism as your MVVM toolkit and just do MVVM and not worry about modules and regions are the two other, you know, kind of big feature sets. And, and that's where the, the more complexity of Prism comes in and the learning curve. Right. Um, because you can use the MVVM stuff. You generally have to learn a little bit about dependency injection to do MVVM right in the first place. And so the, the you know, having a dependency injection container that supports you with that is generally a good thing, but not a required thing. So why, why is that true? Well, because your view models, specifically in an MVVM app, are generally going to have to go do stuff. And right. they often do stuff by using other services, client-side services, re repositories and things like that, that are shared functionality on the client side. Mm -hmm. And you don't want them newing that up each time they use it and, and uh, having to manage the lifetime of that. So because... you, it, mostly for testability, to be honest, but also just for loose coupling, because you, you often want that to be a singleton model, especially something like a repository story that's going to go out and say, go get a bunch of lookup lists from the server side. Mm -hmm. You don't want five different views that use those same lookup lists to go get those lookup lists independently from the server okay. side. You want to get them once, cache them, hold them in memory, and just use them from there. So you centralize that in a client-side repository, and then you have those five view models all come down and get it from there. And so the, the lifetime management of that singleton now you know, shouldn't be in the hands of any one view model trying okay. to do it up. They should just dependency inject it to get to it. So it's patterns like that that kind of drive you down the path of saying, if I'm doing MVVM and I have that extra layer of separation that I have some shared functionality across my view models, then I want to be able to dependency inject those things. Mm -hmm. So that's not a required part, but it's something that you kind of naturally evolve into. And so Prism already has support there for using either Unity or uh, Managed Extensibility Framework out of the mm -hmm. box, but it's also extensible that you can use any in, uh, any container. And there's extensions to, to uh, Prism out there to use all the popular ones. Right. But beyond that, the, the regions and, and modules part, you know, definitely there are lots of apps out there. I just worked with a customer in a financial arena where they have planned they have a, a legacy app that has 150 modules, if you will. They weren't Prism modules at the time, but they're different chunks of functionality that they plug in for different sets of users and, and, and light up as part of the same single top-level application shell from mm -hmm. the user's perspective. So, you know, they don't want to have 150 use case scenarios all built into one big monolithic thing. They've got them separated out into modules and trying to bring those together dynamically in a loosely coupled way at runtime is exactly what the modularity part of, of Prism and the regions in terms of how you plug those views in dynamically uh, was all about for, okay. a, you know, for a large scale composite application like that. The other toolkits don't really address that space. That's something that Prism does more uniquely um, from the other MVVM toolkits. Mm -hmm. So, and and really, Prism was that first and foremost, and kind of evolved into trying to be an MVVM framework in the later right. versions. So, what would your advice be to someone who wants to learn how to use Prism? So, typically, what'll happen is you're you've got an app in mind. I need to build an app, but I think that I should use. I want to use Prism in that. Right. So now, should you not bother with your app and just learn Prism first and then build your app, which would then be the second app, if you will, that you've ever built with Prism? Or do you learn it at the same time you're building your app? Uh, that is a great question. So it really... This is typically the struggle I run into because if I want to learn something, I'm going to do it in the context of an app and then, you know... Yeah, I, I would I would break it down this way. If you listen, you know, if you take what I just said about, you know, you can kind of separate Prism into these two pieces. There's the, I'm going to build a really big complex app with a lot of moving parts that mm -hmm. I want them to all be loosely coupled and come together dynamically. Then you kind of have to learn Prism first and then go build the app because you got to learn how modularity and regions and, and all the MVVM functionality works. Right. Um, and, and the reason you have to do that first is because to set up the infrastructure to do all that stuff, it really starts from this is the first line of code in my you know app.xaml run that kicks off the Prism stuff and gets all that stuff going. Okay. Uh, now you can wire it in later, and in fact we made a specific point of this. We put out some samples in the I think it was the Prism One time frame where we took an existing app. There was a, a popular uh, sample from Vertigo back then. I'm trying to remember. It was a genealogy app. Do you family family show? Yes. 
So okay. the Family Show app, we actually took that, which was you know a fully built, fully functional app, and we added new functionality to it with Prism after the fact. So you certainly can go in and, and you know kind of insert Prism into the mix after the fact, but you're much better off, I would say, if you know you're going to end up there, just start there in the first place okay. and start using you know Prism from the get go. Uh, but if you say, no, my app's really not that big and I, I don't need all that complex dynamic composition stuff, I just want it to be maintainable. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have maybe a couple dozen views and, and, you know, they can all be in one, you know, one project that's fine or, you know, maybe a few projects as class libraries. Mm -hmm. Then I would say you can just evolve into it. Just start building the app and say, hey, I'm going to start doing MVVM here, and then go look at the MVVM bits of Prism and start pulling them in. And you can pretty much ignore modules and, and regions at that point. Okay. I would say the bulk of Prism applications I've worked on with customers, I only use regions in an absolute minimalist fashion. Those are really only useful to me, at least, for these really big, complex, you know, dynamic, lots of navigation, plug-in type stuff going on. And the modularity, again, is only when you have, you know, kind of a high scale thing where you're going to slice things out, give this set of functionality to a different team from mm -hmm. this set of functionality and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so this question is not meant as a comparison with <clears throat> other toolkits, but would your advice be similar for those like MVVM or Caliburn or, or MVVM Cross? Yep. So it's... It's very doable to learn those at the same time you write the app. You don't necessarily need to uh, build just some quick starter sample, learn how to use them, and then build your real live app. You can do both at the same time. I believe so, yeah. Okay. Yep. I mean, you know, there's a certain amount of learning curve there, at least just understanding what the pattern's about and just, you know, the, the basics of the pattern. But you can do that in an incremental fashion with building mm -hmm. your app, I think. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for coming right. on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Great stuff. Hope you enjoyed that, and we'll see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox. Thanks.